polygamy, what love is this? We're glad you joined us again tonight, and we'd like to let you know that this is a live broadcast from Salt Lake City, Utah, where the fullness of the gospel of salvation through polygamy by Joseph Smith's command is lived out daily through the local polygamy groups here. And this is a live telephone call-in program where later on we'll be opening up the telephone lines for you to call and you can ask your questions and voice your concerns or comments uh, about the subject of polygamy. You might want to jot down the telephone number. It's 801-973-8820. That's 973-TV20. I'd also suggest that you go to our webpage. It's on aboutpolygamy.com and there you can find information about polygamy. You can find uh, our future schedule of people that we're going to have interviewed in the future and also previous uh, shows that we've had on streaming video. If you know of anyone who lives outside of the viewing area, uh, you can tell them about it. They can go and watch any of the programs that we've already had. Or if you've missed one, you can go there and watch a previous program. Our, TV, our uh, email address is tv at aboutpolygamy.com and we invite you to send us emails about your concerns about polygamy or questions that you may have. If anything is confidential you'd like to discuss, you're welcome to do that through email. And any ideas that you may have for uh, future subjects that you would like us to cover on this show. <clears throat> and then for our polygamous viewers, we would invite you, if you have any questions or any doubts about your life in polygamy or about polygamy at all, please go to the webpage shieldandrefuge.org that's shieldandrefuge.org. And on that web page is a lot of information about polygamy. It talks about polygamy and what the Bible really says about it. There are stories on there of people who have left polygamy groups, successfully left, and have never regretted it. There is life after polygamy. Uh, everything that you would communicate through there would be totally confidential. And we would just love to uh, talk with you and help you through any issues that you have. We'd like you to know there is a network set up. If anybody is interested in leaving and they feel like that they're forced to stay uh, and they want to leave, let us know. We have a network of safety set up where we will help you leave your polygamy group safely. Our historical tidbit for tonight is uh, something that I wanted to talk about regarding what early Mormon polygamous teachings were about our Lord Jesus Christ, some of them saying he was a polygamist. And so the first quote that I would like to quote is from Orson Hyde. He wrote in the Journal of Discourses, Volume 2, that Jesus was the bridegroom at the marriage of Cana at Galilee. The LDS apostle Orson Pratt said, If all the acts of Jesus were written, we no doubt should learn that those beloved women, Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene, were his wives. And that's written in the Seer, page 159. And then a statement made by Brigham Young, second prophet of the LDS Church, and this is what he said. The scripture says that he, the Lord, came walking in the temple with his train. I do not know who they were unless his wives and children. Journal of Discourses, volume 13. The above quotes show that the early morning Mormon leaders taught that Jesus Christ was a polygamist that he was married, and that some of him, uh, some of them also taught that Jesus had children through these polygamous wives. For example, Orson Hyde said, before the Savior died, he looked upon his own natural children as we look upon ours. That's in the Journal of Discourses, Volume 2. So obviously, the polygamous Jesus is not the same Savior that we read about in the Bible. These statements that I have just read beg for an answer to the doctrine that eternal marriage can be performed only in LDS temples. In what temple was Jesus married? He couldn't have been married in the Jerusalem temple. The Jewish temples were only for blood sacrifices and offerings. God allowed for only one temple where he would put his name, and that temple was in Jerusalem. So Jesus couldn't have been married there he couldn't have been married in any other temple because there was only one. And to close the discussion on Jesus being a polygamist, I'd like to quote Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17, where it tells us that the king is not to multiply wives unto himself. 
By the way, I've heard the arguments that uh, the person is not supposed to multiply wives to himself, he's to let God do it. But we don't see in the Bible where God multiplies wives to anyone. Now, the Bible is clear that Jesus was sinless. He was also the only sinless person that has ever or will ever walk this planet. We know the Bible refers to Jesus as being the King of Kings. Since Jesus Christ is King of Kings, and Deuteronomy 17:17 17, 17 prohibits the king from multiplying wives to himself or being a polygamist, and Jesus Christ was sinless and therefore never broke any of the laws of God, how could Jesus have been a polygamist if he was the king and the king isn't supposed to multiply wives to himself? And so I would just like you to think about those things and you see the Bible does have all the answers. Tonight, uh, once again, we have bad news about our special guest. On June 26, we had invited uh, Susan Schmidt to be here as a guest and as you remember, she became very ill and was unable to come and so she was scheduled to come tonight. However, she had a shattering event on Sunday in which her husband passed away and so obviously she hasn't been able to come tonight either. We would like to offer Susan and her family our deepest sympathy and we ask for God's greatest love, his comfort to be experienced by her and by their family as they go through this trial. However, I'd like to also mention that we share Susan's joy about her husband because right now her husband is walking the streets of gold with Jesus Christ. You see, her husband, Dennis, had obeyed the gospel as the Bible had talked about and had asked Jesus to be his personal Lord and Savior. And so he knew Jesus and the Bible tells us that when we're absent with the body, we're present with the Lord. And so we know that uh, Susan, although she's going through the grief, she also is going through a blessing knowing and being comforted that she knows where her husband is. So tonight we had to come up with plan D once again, or plan B. Actually, we had scheduled this couple to be here later on in August, and when we found out that we needed someone to interview because Susan couldn't be here, I called them and they were just so wonderful and they said, sure, we'd love to be here. And so I would like to introduce a couple who uh, were born and raised in the FLDS polygamy group. Theirs is a story of a successful exit, and uh, it wasn't without difficulties, but they did successfully exit the polygamy group. We welcome Eni, en Enoch, and Jenny Dutson. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, and we just thank you for coming on such short notice tonight. Uh, I'm sure we're gonna enjoy your interview, yeah. and you have a good story, a fascinating story that I'm sure viewers will really enjoy. Well, I'm yeah. glad we could be Plan B. <laughs> <laughs> glad you could be Plan B too. Now your story was fascinating as we were talking about it and before we get in, I'll just let you kind of start and to tell the story, um, but uh, before you get started, I think it would be good for you to first explain your family, uh, who, who your family was in the FLDS group, how important of a family they were or weren't, and the same with you, who, what family that you were from and how important uh, who they were and the faithfulness and loyalty of your family and then we'll get into your own personal stories. Okay, let me start. Um, well, my last name is Dutson. Um, I actually have a lot of family still in the group, a lot that has left. Um, we didn't have, uh, my family personally, my dad and stuff, we didn't have the best last name, you know, a last name was really important in the group. Mm -hmm. Your ties to the prophet and so forth, but and your um, yours wasn't tied to the prophet. No, <laughs> but um, we had a pretty big family. I had a lot of uncles and cousins, and and my dad was a pretty big financial contributor. Mm -hmm. And so they were real loyal to the group. They they had uh, faithful, loyal members of of the FLDS um, group. Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about your family? Um, well, my mom, actually, her dad is Roland Jeffs, so I um, am the, I was the granddaughter of the prophet, and now um, I am the niece of, of Warren of Jeffs. Warren Jeffs. Yeah, who is the um, prophet now, and um, we had some kind of um, 
I guess you could say, status. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. being the, the granddaughter of the prophet, it was just expected of us to be pretty much perfect. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we went to school up at Alta Academy where Warren was the um, principal and... So you were living in Salt Lake during yes. this time? Yes. Were, did, were you both raised in, in Salt Lake in the FLDS group of, in Salt Lake City? Yeah, yes, she lived in Sandy. I grew up in Riverton. Okay. So you didn't grow up in the Colorado City, Hildale area no. at all? No. Just visited? Down yeah, there? we visited quite a bit. I was actually born down there. Yeah. But, but you lived up here? Yeah. Uh, now, when you went to Alta Academy, did you both attend Alta Academy? Yes. Um, for our viewers who may not understand who Alta Academy is, would you want to explain what Alta Academy is? It's just the um, private school that the FLDS set up um, where basically we were taught um, strict Joseph Smith teachings and also the the prophets teachings and then also you know we went there for you know the math English spelling and that kind of thing too uh -huh. so so you got academic teaching as well as religious teaching yeah, yeah. mostly religious teaching though <laughs> that's what I've heard I yeah. felt like it anyway <laughs> <laughs> did they teach you out of the Bible at all um, not particularly they use some of the stories out of the Bible you know they would use the examples of Abraham and his two wives and Jacob and his yeah. four wives and <laughs> and David had you know hundreds of wives and yeah so they use the things out of the Bible that would benefit their that teachings. Would support their teachings yeah, right exactly. mm -hmm. okay um, I've read different things about Warren Jeffs did he frighten you as being uh, he was kind of in charge of the school wasn't he I was never scared of him um, to be honest with you. Is that because he was your uncle? Well, I, yeah, I mean, he definitely had a, a witty, you know, dry sense of humor, and um, I was never scared. Yeah, I was never afraid, you know, of him personally. You know, there was times when I, I was really, really nervous because I had done something wrong in school, and it was like, oh, I'm gonna have to go see the principal again. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a normal nervous principal yeah, nervous that's thing. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, cause I think because he, he had that position of authority was. Yeah. yeah. What about you? Or did he frighten you or intimidate you? Or did no, you ever I, get in I trouble? I thought he so? was kind of a weenie, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, but because he had that position, you know, he had the authority to... whether you could go to school or not, so... Yeah. He, you know, there was that little bit of fear there. Mm -hmm. What about siblings? Did you have siblings that... Uh, older, younger, that were going to school with you that were... Um, maybe supportive of... of of you and and some of the things we're going to get into a little bit later about your relationship. Um, you mean did they brothers and sisters? Yeah, did you? Um, you know, uh, I have I have a lot of siblings, and most of my siblings didn't know a lot about what I was doing. So mm -hmm. um, we all really, really, really looked up to Uncle Warren, and um, you know my my family was so connected you know through my mom and and my mom was actually a teacher up at Alta Academy she taught mm. the the home ec mm -hmm. class and and so yeah I mean it was that was normal that was our normal how many mothers did you have um my dad married two women two women mm -hmm. what about yours he had two wives two wives yeah. and did you did you did was it normal to you I mean did that seem normal to you to have two mothers and a lot of children and I mean, you know, you didn't know anything else, so naturally... Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I absolutely... My, my mom is an amazing woman, and um, I just absolutely loved my second mom. Um, she was closer to my age, and so we got <laughs> along really, really, really well, and, you know, I, I wouldn't have one ill thing to say about well, either one. That's good. So. That's good. Good. And, and would you say the same for your other mothers? Um, other mothers? My mom was the second wife. And uh, my dad's first wife left him years ago. Oh. So. So it was as though he only had one wife in at that point. If, if she well, left. Yeah, well, he had the two wives the whole time I was growing up. It mm. was when I was older oh, that okay. she left. Okay. okay. I actually didn't get along with his first wife. I never liked her until I got older. Then I kind of became good friends with her. Mm. Well, let's talk about um, you, how you met. And, and your life in the group as a couple, as, as a t couple who wanted to be together and the struggles that you had to be together like you wanted to be. So 
Uh, whoever wants to start the story, let's just get into that. It's a, it's a nice story. I really like <laughs> to hear your story. Well, um, I actually, um, I knew of him. I knew about Enoch because um, my sister really liked him. Um, but at the time, my sister and um, his best friend were working together at Ultra Dent, at Dan Fisher's um, place of, of work. And um, they kind of met, they hooked up and started dating. And they thought it would be cool if we could go double dating. And um, so my sister lied to me and said, hey, you know, Joel's friend likes you. And, and um, Had you met him yet? I, I saw him in school because you know, my sister had a crush on him, and so I knew who he was. Um, and so at the she time, was trying to get you to date somebody she had a crush on. No, my other. I have That's two older sister. sisters. Oh, whoa! <laughs> I have two older sisters. The oldest was dating at the time, and uh, my second oldest sister oh, had a crush okay. on him. Oh, your so, other sister. Yeah. Okay. So I knew about him, but I was only in eighth grade, and he was intense. So I was like, he was like pff, old, clear old, <laughs> <laughs> so old. Well, and a little background too is. You know, dating wasn't allowed. Yeah, I was going to ask that. And, you know, girls were supposed to stay away from boys and vice versa. And uh -huh. they weren't supposed to have anything to do with each other until the prophets said, you know, you two are getting married and would put them together. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody was supposed to be placed. So right. when she talks about dating, you know, it was in secret. It, it was Complete. behind the scenes dating. Yeah. Complete yeah. secret. Uh -huh. like. Yeah. Were you, was well. Let's continue with the story. What go on with what? what well, we just point? started sneaking out. Um, you know, we. Um, I, I guess where there's a will, there's a way. And you know, I really wanted to be liked. You know, by the mm -hmm. opposite sex. And um, it was scary. It was a rush. It was that adrenaline. You know, oh, I'm getting away with something naughty. I shouldn't do this. You know, kind of a thing. Okay. And I was just, I was rebellious and. And you're in the eighth grade. Yeah. That's how old? Yeah, I was 14. 14. 14. I was 14 wow, and he was okay. 16. Six. And so um, we just started sneaking out and, hey, I'll meet you here, you know. And we would have either my sister or his friend drive. So they were in, they were culprits with you in this then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah they, they, <laughs> it was their fault. <laughs> they had access to cars and would drive us. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so you would go out at night? Is that what you do, sneak out when everybody was asleep? Yeah. How did you get by with that? Usually at night. Uh -huh. We were sneaky. <laughs> Nobody ever woke up and found you were gone? Well, <laughs> um, I, I lived in a separate house from the building because, well, my dad's house was really small, and he only had three bedrooms in this little house. Um, and my mom had a room, my other mom had a room, and then the boys had a room. And because there were so many of us girls, um, they gutted the chicken coop and turned it into a little, like, apartment. And it was really nice, you know, mm -hmm. had all the everything. And so it's not like they ever heard us. So you were just away from their, yeah, their control, their little radar yeah. there. Yeah. Okay. Well, and we had a large house with you know, the ten plus kids living there at a time, and so it was pretty easy to be on and they not be noticed. They won't miss one, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they were tired anyway. There's a lot of kids, and that wears you out. And so we knew they'd be sleeping. <laughs> like, we so them how out. long did you sneak out together to 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 meet each other like this? And you never did get caught doing it. No. We came pretty close a few times. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, a few times we actually snuck out during the day. Um, I was kicked out of school at that time um, <laughs> in eighth grade. See, it's all my fault. All, I was kicked out of history. school, and so um, we would actually meet up during the day. He was supposed to be going to Alta Academy, and we would just call, and when he could get the car after he got his license, we'd meet up at the mall, and I, I remember seeing people that we knew there, and they didn't recognize me because... I was in worldly clothes. Oh, you, know, you were so. really being rebellious, weren't you? Yeah. According to the standards of the group. Completely. Oh. Completely. And if you'd been caught, what would have happened? Ah. Um, <laughs> be in <laughs> trouble. Oh, yeah. What kind of we trouble? didn't think about that. It's like, you know, if we get yeah, caught, that. we'll worry about that. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, what we happened? Started so. sneaking out and kept sneaking out. And? and then she got pregnant. <laughs> she was, got pregnant? Yeah, it was her fault. I, <laughs> she, she got <laughs> I don't know how it happened. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, I ended up pregnant, 
um, although I didn't All know. All by yourself. It's just like, yeah. what? How did that oh, work? I helped. <laughs> so, wow, it's a little warm in here. <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, you know, I, I started feeling weird and different, and, and at this point, we knew there was no hope. I mean, when you sin that far, there's no hope. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I pretty much knew my chances were toasted. And mm -hmm. so now I, your chances for like, what are you talking, heaven, um, exaltation? For heaven, yeah, for all of for that. Her. Yeah, I mean, I, I knew that um, I was beyond hope. And so at that point, I just, I, I kind of suspected that I was pregnant. And um, I just packed up and I think my oldest sister, and she still hasn't told me to this day, but I think my oldest sister saw um, my bags packed and, and she went and ratted us out. Oh. All of us, oh. all of us that were sinning. Oh my. So yeah. That must have been a scandal. <laughs> Jerry Springer. <laughs> oh yeah, it was. <laughs> it was bad. It was bad. I mean, probably a couple of days, I mean, hundreds of people knew about it. And oh, wow. Everybody. <laughs> so did they, did people gang up on you and, and maybe just, you know, really lecture you and damn you or, no. or did they encourage you? What happened? No, it's more of a, just a judgmental thing M most people just kind of shun you I mean I had lots of friends in high school and after they found out I was doing this I mean they all stopped talking to me with, with the exception of one friend I had one friend who's remained your friend yeah. yeah I'd like to make a remark right here at this point for our viewers who probably or may not understand uh, the situation when you're in a polygamy group the last thing you do is go out and date and get pregnant uh, outside of wedlock. Uh, that is the worst sin that you can do. It's one of the unforgivable sins of a polygamy group. You just don't do that. And when you do do it, you get in, in very deep trouble. And, and like uh, Jenny said, there's no hope for her heaven, uh, her eternity shot at this point. That's what they teach you. And it's a very traumatic uh, situation to be in. So. Uh, let's go back with uh, what, what, what other, by the way, other unforgivable sins are there in your group before we continue? Um, well, it was adultery, uh, fornication, and murder were all unforgivable, but the worst was to, to leave, become apostate to the religion. To, they called it turning traitor, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that was the worst sin you could ever commit. You know, there's no forgiveness. No forgiveness nothing. for apostate. But there is forgiveness for, for murder and fornication? Um, no, I don't think there is. Not was. for that either? But th that was considered worse. <laughs> yeah? Okay. Oh. All right, so now you're in trouble. What, what, did you want to get married? Did you think you loved each other? Did you ask to, to your parents to let you get married? What happened? Um, I think the prophet told us it would probably be best that we got married. It's just like a legal marriage. The prophet told you that? Yeah. yeah. Warren or originally? Rulon? Well, because, you know, Rulon. they have a marriage by the prophet, which is a celestial marriage, but he said, uh -huh. you know, just go get legally married because we weren't worthy for a celestial marriage. Um, oh, okay. But uh, my dad kind of intervened, said, you know, that's probably not a good idea for him to get married right away. He said, I, I he wanted us to go through a six month trial period and kind of prepare to be married, you know, I could get a job and start preparing a home and stuff and basically a time of repentance. Uh-huh. And so, and we weren't supposed to talk to each other, see each other during, during that, that six months period six of time. Months. Okay. So we went, to, well, we did pretty good. We talked to each other a few times. So you snuck around talking to each other like you snuck around to meet each other at first anyway. How, how did they mm -hmm. even trust you to? <laughs> at that point, didn't they? I don't know. I feel so well, bad. And we would <laughs> see we would see each other at church, and it was really awkward because you know I would see her every couple of weeks, and she was getting bigger and bigger. But we weren't allowed to talk to each other. Uh huh. And that was really hard because I knew that I loved him and I wanted to be with him. Um, but when his dad stepped in and said it's not going to happen, it really that crushed just, him. Yeah, yeah, completely crushed. Him. I'd like to remind our viewers this is a live telephone call-in program. If you want to uh, make some phone calls and, and ask some questions of our guests, we'd love to hear from you. The number is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. And we do have a call right now from Lionel in Bountiful, and we'll take that. Hello, Lionel? Lionel? Hello? 
Welcome to the program. Hello. I guess Lionel in Bountiful is not in Bountiful. So we'll continue with your, um, with your story, but we'd invite you all to give us a call and uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions. So you want to get married, but, you, but they don't want you to. You think you're in love with each other, but they don't want you to be involved with each other for six months. Yeah, repentance and, time. And I was, I was really mad at my dad at the time, but I think he had some wisdom in it because we were so young and, you know, he thought it was a time of preparation. Mm -hmm. So we went through the six months and I went with my dad to see the prophet. And he's like, okay, you know, he's prepared a place for them to live and he's got a job and all this. And he says, you know, why don't you go ahead and let's get him married. And the prophet Roland Jeff said, no, I'm not going to do that. Six months isn't enough time to repent. Just have him keep doing what he's doing. And what were you doing to repent, according to their standards? Just, um, just be obedient, I guess. You know, pay my tithing, go to church, and you know, work projects, work projects, different things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that would make you worthy. Yeah. Okay. And you. Yeah. Well, I kind of knew by then, um, and my dad was really, really open and honest with me, and he gave me the heads up that if you get rebaptized, it, it's as though um, you didn't sin because I didn't have the priesthood. And so because I was getting rebaptized, then I would have been made worthy um, of a man that could exalt me and my kids. Mm -hmm. And so when I got rebaptized, you know, when I was pregnant, um, I kind of for knew that they were gonna maybe try to just have us not see each other ever again that that they would maybe want me to be married to somebody else mm. so you suspected that's what they were going to do well yeah because we were rebellious and I was calling him and talking to him and he was telling me what the prophet was saying and then when I would go in and see the prophet it was a total different story Oh, and so I was okay. like, oh, okay. okay, I don't know what to, to do about this. Uh -huh. See, and it was, it was a worse sin for me because I had the Aaronic priesthood. You had the priesthood. So. How old are you when you get the priesthood in the FLDS? Uh, <coughs> Twelve years old. and then Twelve. And then at 18, you get the Melchizedek priesthood. Okay. So that's what was part of my repentance was to get rebaptized and become worthy of getting the Melchizedek priesthood. And uh huh. So you were able to get, the, the, supposedly, to get the priesthood back, and then you would be able to exalt your wife at that point, but right now you couldn't. Yeah, I did. I actually did. I got, I, they gave me the Melchizedek priesthood, and I, I, you know, went through all the steps, and, but it never happened, you know. I kept yeah. going to see the prophet, kept asking him, and he said, oh, just keep paying your tithing, do this and that. And, and they kept putting you off and putting you off, and, and, and in the meantime, you're going to have a baby. And then yeah. I delivered. Baby. You had a baby, and, and then, then you had the baby before you got married. Yeah, um, I I actually delivered him up at um, the prophet's house in one of the rooms that they had um, set aside for labor and delivery, and um, quite a few of his wives helped with that delivery, but it, it went bad, and I ended up, af after having the baby, I um, had to be rushed to the emergency room. Wow. And, so and you're, how old are you now, 15? I was 15. I was 15. And so well, at, at least they took you to the emergency room. I know there's some who wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, I remember yeah. bits and pieces of it, but um, I, I do vaguely remember hearing, um, we're going to lose her if we don't. And um, Give you a blood transfusion. Yeah. Wow. Well, so when they, took, when they took me to the emergency room, um, the doctor was really, really upset and just started kind of um, getting after my, my family, my mom and my dad, and saying, this girl needs a blood transfusion. And um, my dad says, nope, that's against our religion. And if, if Heavenly Father's ready to take her home, then I'm ready to give her. And I just thought, well, just let me go. This hurts. Mm, my goodness. <laughs> that's another belief, too, is that we were supposed to be the pure blood, and we weren't supposed to mix ours with others. Oh, that's so. right, yeah. OK, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, they, the, the pure bloods are also in the group I'm from. They claim to be pure blood, bloods as well. Is that interesting? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you uh, are welcome to give us a call at 801-973-TV20. We do have a call from Harley in Kolob Canyon. Good evening, Harley. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, uh, I'd like doing to ask well. a question if I might. Uh, first of all, let me, let me say that I, I can't really relate to uh, 
the experiences that you've had, but, but I can be sympathetic because it, it seems to me that the things that are done by the FLDS and, and the Kingstons and some of these groups are completely reprehensible. And it, it amounts to spiritual and physical slavery, in a sense, and uh, it's really hard to comprehend. But, but with, with that in mind, I'd like to read, if I may, three verses from Isaiah and ask uh, for your comment, if I could. I'll read them quickly. Is that all right? Okay. Okay. Uh, and in that, this is chapter 4, uh, verse 1 through 3. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Uh -huh. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. Uh, and it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. And this is clearly a millennial text uh, extolling the virtues of uh, polygamy. To uh, well, let me take, to take you back to verse 1 on that. Okay. Uh, it says, in that day. Right. And what is that day? Uh, that day, is, that day is, is right now, because Isaiah... Well, let's, let's go back and let's take the context on that. What does chapter 3 say? I mean, we, we can't obviously do a whole uh, study on chapter 3, but if you go back into the context, the, uh, the Think time of the daughters of Zion and so forth. The daughters of Zion in those days of Isaiah were being totally ungodly and they were, uh, they were worshiping idols and they were uh, uh, more interested in their own personal affairs than they were in the affairs of God. And so God is telling them in chapter 3 that if they don't straighten up and start going back to worship the one and only true God of Israel, that they, he was going to send an army against the nation and destroy it. And he says, in that day is when these things were going to be so bad for the women of Israel that the men in war naturally die off and leaves more women than men. And the women would need some protection. It's not talking about polygamy. It's talking about the protection of a woman in a post-war society. May I respond? Uh, the term reproach, when used uh, about a woman in the Old Testament, is oftentimes barrenness. In other words, their barrenness is a reproach. and so Right, but it's not the only reproach that a woman would have. And in, in verse 4, it talks about the spirit of burning, which, see, everything in Isaiah really relates to the last days. Well, no, uh, th there's a lot of history in Isaiah that relates to the very day that he was talking. True, was and, and also he has intermediate events in his future, but he used his events and his future to predict the end of the world. And, uh, and, uh, and it, this Isaiah verse. did the whole gambit from the time that he was there until the end of the world. That is correct. But the context of the verses you're talking about is not talking about present day polygamy at all. It's talking about the destruction because of the disobedience of the women of Jerusalem at that time. Uh, okay. Also, uh, what are your thoughts, if I may ask, on uh, consenting adults uh, practicing polygamy? In other words, we have a time now in, in the United States which someone some people consider to be Babylon you've got sodomite marriages in California for example uh, why if, if consenting adults uh, wish to live uh, polygamy what what would it be wrong with that our focus um, Harley is that the polygamy groups uh, that we have had experiences with will use the Bible to prove that um, polygamy is required by God in order for exaltation and for a place in heaven. And our approach is to use the Bible to disprove their lies because it isn't there. If uh, two consenting adults want to do something, we're not going to attack that. What we're going to do is hold up the Word of God, hold up Jesus Christ as the Savior alone. And we also want to be sure that these polygamy groups quit uh, and stop uh, forcing women and children and men, uh, boys, to believe a lie that isn't there. We're not going to get into uh, activism and all of these uh, different concerns that's going on around the country. We're interested in helping people that are in polygamy. They want out and they are suppressed. They're kept there and that isn't right. We don't want that to happen. We want them to know the full true gospel of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Well, th thank you for your comments. Thank you, Harley. Good night. Okay, we have Paul in Riverton. Hello, Paul. How you doing? Uh, we're doing fine, thank you. 
What is your question? Oh, I just wanted to say hi to my brother, Enoch, and why he didn't tell oh. me he was going to be on the <laughs> Sorry, I spaced it. I was going to tell you, and I forgot and where he left. And my sister as well, why she didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so my comment was to that last guy. I mean, um, he was talking about the, the polygamy and stuff. I mean, Joseph Smith brought the polygamy church back, but why he brought it back was because a lot, lot of the men went to war and fought and stuff, and a lot, lot of them was killed, and so there was a kind of a hob or tea right there of of nobody to take care of the wife and their children, and so that's why it got started back up. You know, we're we're going to deal with that, Paul, in a future program. Um, of some of the myths of polygamy and actually that isn't true because there was not a shortage of men at all. In fact, there was consistently more men in the census than there was women in those times. And, and then when you look at section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, it has nothing to do with benevolence. It has everything to do with uh, the eternal marriage. So it was, polygamy wasn't because of a lack of men and of war. Oh. Well, that's what I was kind of taught in the first uh -huh. poll, too, is why it all started like yeah, that. Yeah, a lot of people have been taught that, but when you just look at the facts, yeah. that just isn't the case. Yeah. Uh-huh. And like they were talking about how worn and stuff kind of was. I, I, I mean, back when, back when I knew Warren in school and stuff because he taught me, I mean, he was, to me, he was a pretty good man, but between the power and stuff that after he became and all that he just like completely like, turned it into like an evil thing because of the way the way he had so much power and control and so he'd put fear in pe people and mm -hmm. stuff yeah they use fear and guilt and shame a lot in these groups to control people and then we've all heard the saying that ultimate power could uh, corrupts ultimately so i yeah. think we see that happening so are you older or younger than um than Enoch. I'm two years older. Two years older. Okay. Well, we appreciate your call, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye, e e Enoch. Love you. <laughs> Love, Love you. you. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> <laughs> Love Paul. He's a good guy. Okay. Yeah, we right. have a call that came in from a questioner. He said, how do your guests deal with shunning and rejection? Have you had to deal with that? Is that something? Of course, talking about people in your own group, have you been shunned and rejected? Oh. Definitely. Um, I, I honestly haven't seen the biggest majority of my family for probably over three years. Um, my dad ended up losing his family, and I'm sure part of it is because so many of his kids um, messed up so bad, you know, did that's what I did. That's where they take the family away from yes, him and reassign yes. them to someone yeah. else. And oh, I have no awful. idea where he is. And really? I mean, God knows where he is, and I know, I know someday... I'll get to see him again. Uh -huh. I know so I you probably had quite a concern in the El Dorado um, oh, yeah. uh, rescue attempt down there, wondering if people that yeah. you knew were in there. Yeah, and I looked. I looked at every single photo, and, I, and it completely consumed me. And I just, yeah. I know that, you know, in God's timing, yeah. I'll be able to see him again. So, um, but yeah, shunning and that kind of thing, especially being the, the granddaughter of the prophet at the time, it was, I was such a disappointment to my family and you know, my dad never treated me like that. My dad always just said, you know what, as long as there's life, there's hope, and you keep your chin up, you wow. keep going. That's nice. You know, um, That's good. and so. To have your support from that. From yeah, that. I mean, I think he was pretty used to being shunned. Um, he didn't have the chosen name. I didn't care. <laughs> so he was <laughs> used to it. Yeah, yeah, he was used to it. He was like, <laughs> So, well, your um, brother's not shunning you. He called you. And he's awesome. Yeah, that's nice. He's awesome. That's good. He's one of the ones out. So, yeah. Um, and I did want to say um, two things actually, to Harley um, in Colob County or Colob. Uh -huh. um, I heard him on Sean McCraney on Tuesday well, night, too. and I um, I prayed for him, and I know God's gonna just okay. get a hold of him. So. Harley, you're being prayed for. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> and hi to Paul. <laughs> Okay, we have uh, Lionel in Bountiful. Let's see if he's here this time. Hello, Lionel. Hello, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing just fine, thank you, Lionel. Th welcome to the show. Yeah, I got cut off last time. Oh, we tried to call you, but uh, nobody answered. Yep, okay. <laughs> What's your anyway, question for my us? My question is, is uh, uh, I know quite a few of the 
people from there much down there, but I never did, do hear too much about the incest problems. In uh, in the Colorado now, City, are you talking about? Yes, I uh, I used to be a landlord to two of Warren Jeff's kids, and and I know other people down there, but I I'm from the Kingston bunch. They kicked me out a long time ago, but uh, I just wanted to have the same incest problems down there that the Kingston says. You want to take that? Um, and to me, the, the incest problem is a lot worse than the polygamy problems, you know? Uh, it is. I wouldn't say it's it's a problem with all the families. I think there's certain Hello? families that it is. Yeah, he's answering. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, I, I heard that, but I didn't hear anything else. Oh, I was saying it's it's not... I don't believe that it's a problem with everyone. I'm, I know there's certain families that it is a problem, and it does go on. But I've heard people on TV saying, you know, it's everybody is doing this, everybody's bad, and, and it's, it's really not that way. There are a lot of good people there. How close uh, of incestual relationships do they do? What's the closest that they do of the incestuous marriages? Um, do they do brother sister marriages or just cousins no, or they do, they do cousins. first cousins? I've do they do any cousins. closer than that? Not that I'm aware of. None that I'm aware of. But did that answer your question, Lionel? Yeah, pretty much. They don't have. Uh, they, they've not a history of having problems with the babies there. Deformed babies, stuff like that. Um, well, none of mine. Um, no, I. I would say there's definitely um, some issues. And, you know, we can't speak for everybody. You know, we, we can only talk about what's happened with us, and, um, and it's, it's... I guess I can't hear them. <laughs> she, she's saying that it um, it's not, uh, hasn't been a big problem as far as she's concerned. It's not happening with everybody, but it is happening um, somewhat there, not like it is in some of the other groups. I see. Yeah, yeah I know in the Kingston group, when, when it happens, you know, they keep it really quiet. And, yeah. uh, but it, it's happened a lot yes, it in is. my time. It is happening a lot in that group. It has done, yes. And, and they have very close relationships, not yes. just cousin. A lot of brother and sister. Yeah, yeah. Half, you know. Uh huh. Okay, well, is there any other question, Lionel, or does that cover it? Uh, it'll probably cover it. I'd like to see you get more of this stuff on the, on the TV, on uh, the problems that it does cause. and and let, let people know what they're really getting into. We do have a program coming up uh, that we're going to be dealing with incest, and uh, that will be coming up in two or three weeks. Okay. So you might want to stay tuned for that. We'll try and watch it. Okay. Thank you, Lionel. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh. Good night. Bye. Okay, we have Ray from Benjamin. Hello, Ray. Hi. Hello. Welcome to the program. I wanted to say hi to Phoenix and Jeannie. Haven't seen them for a long time. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> oh, this is hi. awesome. Hi. So what's your relationship to them? Uh, I was baptized with Jenny. Oh, okay. I helped put on their wedding, and I just wanted to tell them that I love them dearly, and so does Jeannie Ward. And we're having a meeting tomorrow night at Jeannie Ward. It sure would be nice to see them. Well, thank you for that invite. That's good to hear you, Ray. Yeah. That's good to see you guys. We love you. We sure love you, too. Thanks for helping us with the wedding. <laughs> You're sure welcome. Yeah, we, it sure be nice to see you guys at Jeannie's tomorrow. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you, Ray, for calling. Okay, bye. Uh, good night. We have Michael in Mapleton. Is this a Michael you know, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Michael. Hi. Hello. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you. Um... I was just wondering if you could answer a couple of questions for me. Uh, were all polygamy marriages celestial, meaning they were f for this life and the next, everlasting? Uh, yes, if if they were, did, that, not like we did, if they were placed by the prophet, then he, he would do a celestial marriage and it was called for time and all eternity. Okay. It was, uh, the reason I bring that up is because my, my main question was that some of their rational, rationalization was that to have polygamy was because there was more women than men. Now, because of wars, and then if they're a celestial marriage and carry on to the next life or the next, you know, 
kingdom is there more women in heaven than men? Well, according to LDS doctrine, there would be because most of the men up there are polygamous. Does that make sense, though? I mean, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> Not much of it does make sense, Michael, from any viewpoint that you take of it. It really doesn't. Okay. And one other quick question. Um, what is the uh, falling out rate as far as men versus women in polygamy groups? Are the the women more likely to come out of it because they're forced to be with a man that they don't really love? Um, I, I would say it's more men than women come out of it. Like a lot of the young men that have been kicked out because they haven't been Worthy. doing what they're supposed to, you know, maybe get into a little bit of trouble, they get kicked out of the community and become yeah. shunned and just end up leaving and never going back. A lot of the men will be uh, moved out because they end up being competition for the young girls. Oh, I see. Well, I appreciate it. Uh-huh. I enjoy your program. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Good night. Okay, we have a question. Why does the LDS deny connection with the FLDS? I think we get that question about every week. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a good question each week, isn't it? Do, yeah. do you folks have a, an opinion on that you'd like to put out? Um, I, I ask that question a lot. I mean, why is the LDS Church so ashamed of, of the polygamy and stuff that goes on? Because it's part of their history. I mean, most of the people in this valley, their ancestors were polygamists. Mm -hmm. That's true. If, if they were, if they're from here, if they're from the Salt Lake area or the Intermountain West, they most likely have a, a history of polygamy, their ancestors. And yet they mm -hmm. want to back away from it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I was going to say, in, when we were in the group, we were taught um, that the LDS church was the great, um, it, w it was basically the apostate church, mm -hmm. that we were the true church right. and that they were the apostate. Um, and so we, we grew up with, with like this hatred towards them. So, I mean, maybe they're just filling their vibes. I mean, maybe they just feel, you know, hated and so, we get hated. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I know that they are the LDS Church uh, really wants to let the world think them as of, of them as being Christian, and Christians uh, obviously don't have a history um, from the New Testament times on. It's pro polygamy is prohibited, yeah. and it just isn't what the the Mormon Church does not want to get involved with uh, something that doesn't show them to be Christian, and so that I think is part of it yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> we're getting close to the winding down here, and we still haven't gotten to your uh, the meat of your story. So let's oh, see if we'll we have can to <laughs> <laughs> speed through this. Well, okay. Where do you want us to start? From? Well, you well, had your baby, and uh, did were you going to say something? Yeah, she had the baby, and it was, he was about six or seven months old before um, they had found another man for her to marry and she decided she wasn't going to. I bailed. She still loved me for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> you rebelled, so, yeah. and you said yeah. no. I did. And I, that's a no-no to say no. Yeah, that we kind of rebelled a, no. a lot, didn't we? Yeah, but um, you know, through it all, I, you know, I, I did want to say that so many times um, the men and the fathers in the, the FLDS get such a bad rap that they force their daughters to marry in some situations, I'm sure it's true, mm -hmm. um, I would be the exception. My dad came home and sat us both down and just said, are you sure this is what you want? And I said, yes, yes, I'm, you know, if you may, if, if I go and marry this other man, I'm going to end up committing adultery and running away with him. So which one is the bigger sin? What should I do? Should I run away now and make it this big of a sin? Or should I, you know, commit <laughs> adultery and run away later? Which one? <laughs> And um, that made sense to him, huh? Yeah, I just said, I'm just trying to be good here. I was just trying to be good, you know? <laughs> so her dad talked to us and said, you know, what you're doing, you know, the repercussions that if you do this. And we're like, yeah, we were going to go ahead and do it. So uh -huh. he said, well, let's do this right. And he took us down to the courthouse and we got, got legally it. married. Good. Good. We Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, 
And then we had uh, three other boys. We have four boys together. Uh -huh. We were married for about eight years. And around that time, our marriage was starting to fall apart because of our past and different things we had done. We were never fully accepted in the group. And mm -hmm. even though the, the prophet did give us a celestial marriage, then they began telling us, you know, that that I wasn't worthy to exalt her and and how did that make you feel? Um, it actually caused a lot of depression for me because I, I wanted to do what I thought was the right and I had a lot of being told that you couldn't attain this, you know, you yeah. could only advance so far, you, you know, you're kind of... At this time, did you have any doubts that their doctrine was true or false? Yeah, I had doubts. Um, she had doubts, but we yeah. didn't know how to talk to each other about it. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of fear that you can't talk to anybody about your problems because mm -hmm. if you talk to someone about your problems, then everybody knows your problems. And, mm -hmm. yeah. and so you never learned to communicate. Yeah, and then that's when they made the big call to move down to Colorado City um, around the time of the 2002 Olympics because mm -hmm. the end of the world was going to happen. Um, and at that point, because we were so shunned and because of what, you know, our, our marriage was just disintegrating, um, then we legally separated and my family all moved down to Colorado City and I just stayed up here with my four boys. And you stayed here? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question there that said, what happened with Jenny's baby? He's alive and doing well <laughs> and almost 15 years old. He, um, he's doing awesome. As well as the other three Plus boys. Plus the other three. Yes. Okay, great. So. Um, let's take Mike from Midvale. Hello, Mike. Hi, how are you guys doing tonight? Hello, how are you? Good. Uh, my question is, uh, I think it's obvious with the, wearing the cross around the neck that uh, they're Christians, correct? Yep. Yes. Okay, uh, how did that happen, and did they ever consider joining the mainline LDS church? Okay, should we, uh, should we have them answer the question uh, after you hang up? Because sure, cool. I think that's part of the story, too, if we can get that far. <laughs> Thank right. you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, bye. Um, no, we never, I never considered joining the mainstream LDS. Um, but yeah, we got divorced. We were divorced for three years. Um, got, you know, we started drinking. Um, I hit rock bottom really fast because I, you know, the depression from missing my family so bad and um, I just wanted to experiment with everything, you know, so I really took a liking to drinking and um, he was just amazing the whole time. He just financially well, took care of me and the boys and... Just a quick comment, a lot of people that leave, they deal with that depression mm -hmm. because they feel like there's no hope for them, that they're damned to hell and, you know, that's it because they've left. So a lot of people do turn to drinking and drugs and... They do. A huge percentage actually do, don't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's continue. So um, I just, I basically hit rock bottom and made a decision I was going to go back. Um, and the one time, the, the day that I went back for my grandfather's funeral, they wouldn't let me in the building. And that was when I decided, man, I must be the lowest scum of the earth. I mean, I, there was no hope. You know, when they said, I'm sorry. You know, my dad said, I'm sorry. You, you can't even go in the building. Oh, my. So... On the way back from there, that's where I decided I was going to um, leave, you know, Salt Lake and just go back because I couldn't take it anymore. And go back to Colorado City yep. and just and join just, the group? Yep, and just do whatever it was they told me to do because I was so miserable. And leave him behind? Yeah, but I didn't tell him. I mean, I just thought I should be a good woman and take all the money out of his account and then just run with all four of our kids. <laughs> Not say a word to him. Huh? Yeah, I mean, he, what he didn't know wasn't going to hurt him. Yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so... Um, and you, did you have a clue that she was leaning in that direction at all at that time? No, not really. No. <laughs> My bad. My bad. Um, so, yeah, at that point, that's where I just, I hit rock bottom. Um, met a gal who um, basically told me the saving grace of Jesus Christ, and, and I accepted. Mm-hmm. So you became a Christian at that point and started going to church. Yep. And yeah. you're not yet. You're not a Christian No, it, it took me a while. She, she had a, a boyfriend at the time, and she tried to get him to go to church with them, and 
he's like, I'm not going to do that stupid. And so I said, well, I'll go with you. And so we started going. And at that point, I was baptized with our three youngest boys. Wow. Um, um, you know, after being saved. And um, we would go to church together. You know, I would just go and pick him up, and then we'd go to church together. And everybody introduced us as, this is Jenny and her husband, Enoch. And I'd be like, we're divorced. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that happened. And so now you're you're both serving the Lord in your church and, and happy with remarried and, and yeah, remarried, and, remarried and remarried and that's great. Three that's, years now. That's yeah. awesome. So. That's great. That's a good story. Okay, uh, we hope you enjoyed the uh, the story tonight with Enoch and Jenny Dutson, uh, and we do appreciate your being with us tonight. I'd like to uh, tell you about next week's uh, guest. His name is Brian Mackert and uh, he's written a book of his own personal experiences in, and observations in the polygamy group and his successful journey out of the bondage. Uh, he has a stunning story, so we would really uh, think that you would enjoy being here. And also, I would like to make a few comments about uh, our obligation to test God's Word. And uh, the, the false religions of the country thrive because of biblical illiteracy. And if we were obedient to God, we would check everything that we hear by the Bible and test it and use it as our plumb line. And a lot of pain and a lot of deception that is perpetrated through false religions just would not happen if we would be obedient to do that. Psalm 119 is a good psalm for you to read. It has a lot of information in there about using God's Word to test everything that you hear. Uh, Acts 17.11 tells us what God thinks is noble, and a noble person is someone who will search the scriptures every day to see if what you're learning is true. And 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, test everything and hold on to the good. And so my question would be, what does everything mean? Everything. That doesn't mean that you can trust your heart. Jeremiah 17.9 says, the heart is deceitful and beyond cure. So the biblical Jesus is the only way to salvation. It's only Him and Him only, and He is the one that we ask you to depend upon for your salvation, not polygamy. Thank you for joining us, and good night. Mm -hmm.